So I'd love to invite Ernie and Tina Duke up to the platform. Let's honor them. So this couple is amazing. If you don't know them yet, they're here another week, maybe, <laughs> this time. <laughs> um, there are missionaries in Uruguay, have been for decades. The Lord has used them to bring his kingdom and to bring change in a nation. And we're so excited that they get to share with us this morning and thrilled that we get to send you and love you guys and count you as our own. Good morning, Westgate. Uh, let's try that again. Good morning, Westgate. <laughs> Good to be in the house of the Lord, right? Tu presencia es el cielo para mí. Your presence is heaven to me. Hallelujah. Just remember, it goes with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. Thank you, Chris and worship team for taking us to that place, to his presence. Uh, take advantage of those moments on Sunday morning or wherever you are in the house of the Lord. And, and while you worship him, just in a split of a second, let him do that which is needed in your heart and my heart for him to do. Uh, Anna and, and, and Aaron, thank you so much for leading Westgate Global Missions. Uh, it's a privilege to work alongside with you guys and, well, have you here at home at this time and seeing you raising the next generation of missionaries right out of Westgate and sending them to the nations. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. Well, we are Tina and Ernie, uh, like Anna said. <laughs> We just want to say that we love you guys. We love you so much. It has been our joy to worship with you. And when Pastor Chris began to sing in Spanish, it was like it propelled me <laughs> all the way down to Uruguay. He, he came and sang that song in Uruguay. And, you know, I was thinking, your presence is heaven, right? Mm -hmm. In heaven, there's no sickness. In heaven, there's no addictions. In heaven, you know, his presence is there. So when we get into his presence, we can count on healing. We can count on deliverance. We can count on him coming in and meeting us um, and meeting our needs. I just want to leave with you uh, a verse in Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3.20. Uh, Paul prays for the Ephesian church in 20, and then his benediction uh, in chapter 3, and then his benediction in, chap in verse 20 is, um, God can do mm -hmm. abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. Mm -hmm. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Mm -hmm. There are great things that God desires to do in and through us. It's by the power of his Holy Spirit. Things that we can't even imagine. And when those things happen, church, he gets the glory. He gets the glory. Amen. God bless you abundantly. Amen. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, we're going to have a mission Sunday this morning. Is that okay? That would be a Jesus service, right? Because he, he, he's got a mission's heart. Uh, the father is a missionary too because he had one son and he sent him. The Holy Spirit is a mission, missionary as well. You know, he came and, and said, I will give you the power that you will be witness right here and in your county and in your state and in your country and to the ends of the earth. And his church is a missions church too. So welcome Westgate Chapel to a mission Sunday this morning. It's a privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, we've been here with you for a few Sundays. We will be returning uh, next week back to the mission field in Uruguay. Uh, so many new faces. So glad to have met so many of you, seen so many of you, and seeing some of the old faces too. Uh, it's always good as well. Uh, and, and Westgate, thank you so much. For 40 years now, you've been supporting us. You've been praying for us. You send us out in, in the early 80s to the mission field, first in Mexico and then to Uruguay. 
uh, Westgate has always been a missions church. Uh, when it was planted in 1959, uh, planted the first senior pastor that came here to the little chapel that used to be here on the side of Edmonds Way. It was Pastor Roger Anderson who had returned from the mission field and he had returned from Liberia, West Africa, where he had been a missionary. And ever since then, this church has been a sending church, a supporting church, a praying church, a, a missions church. And before I move on, I just saw a familiar face. I need to recognize a friend who's visiting us from Texas here this morning, Joe Kennard. Good to see you here. I can see that far. Joe Kennard used to be an elder here at the church. He has a heart for missions almost as big as Jesus' heart for missions. Not quite that big, but he's got a big heart. So good to see you this morning here. He's blessed the nations also uh, through his person and through his love for the nations. Uh, good to see you. Missions. First, we went to Mexico in '83 to an unreached uh, to central Mexico to an unreached uh, region where there were no churches. We took a, 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 a team of young people, went to Mexico for two and a half months that first year, and and, and went down to help some churches and uh, church planning, and uh, we're, we're preaching and and with. Uh, um, visiting and, 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 and working and preaching. And, and on the last weeks that we were there, we were invited to return, came home and then returned back to central Mexico with a specific task to evangelize and to church plan in central Mexico. And then in 98, God called us 25 years ago, God called us to Uruguay, the least evangelized nation in Uruguay. And God blessed us in Mexico. God blessed us in, in Uruguay. And God is blessing the nations. God is blessing the nation. There's a new thing happening in the nations. Uh, I would like to give you a little, a brief history of missions and in, in modern missions. Uh, when I say modern missions, 200 years. Uh, 200, for those of you that have little hair or white hair, 200 years is little, it's, 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 it's a short, it's modern. Uh, for those of you that are this big, you go for 200 years as an eternity and a half. Uh, my grandson, I, I was talking to him yesterday and said, he's five years old. He said, dad, that was six years ago? He's five. He said, that's a, an eternity. Uh, I don't know if he knows what an eternity is, but... So I would like to talk to you this morning, uh, uh, missions, God's heart for the nations and what God is doing a little bit around the nations. Um, how did it all start 200 years ago? Well, it started 500 years ago, a little over 500 years ago when the Reformation, Martin Luther and then the, the radical Reformation with the Anabaptists and the Mennonites. And that's, that's my background there, the Anabaptists 500 years ago in, in, Eastern, in Northern Europe. And they, when they, they went more radical than the, than, the, than, the reforma than the Reformers went. So they found themselves being persecuted not only by the Roman church, but also later on by the, by the Reformers. Because they said, oh, you want water baptism by immersion? Yeah. So anyway, that's church history for you. The, the Catholics would burn them at the stakes and, 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 and the, 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 the Lutherans would drown them in the river because they wanted to be rebaptized again, but they had to pay a big price and they did pay a big price. That was 500 years ago. And then for 300 years, they, 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 they struggled. They, 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 they were persecuted. They, they run from, from Switzerland. They run to Holland, from Holland to Germany. And then they were hiding in different countries and see which king would give them a little covering and which king would give them protection and, and whatnot. And then in 300 years later, in the, tw in the 19th century, uh, the, uh, the missions movement started. They were established, well-established. The, 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 the evangelical Christian church was well-established in Northern Europe. And they started the... the the missions movement, and the movement hasn't stopped, and it's not going to stop until every tribe, every language, every, every people group in the world has heard that there's a name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. And when you sing the name, there is power. I sing that name over my family. I sing that name over the nations. I sing that name over neighborhoods. You can sing that name. You can proclaim that name. There is power in that name, in the name of Jesus. And that name is being heard today all over the world. The first, there's, there, there are four waves 
Uh, there have been four waves in, in, in 200 years. The first wave, the coastline uh, of the continents. And I believe, I never talked to Pastor Alec about this, but I believe that perhaps it was around that time, 150 years ago, when his family moved from Great Britain down to, to the coast of South Africa and established themselves before he came over to the States. But that was the first movement. It was the coastlines of the continent. They would leave Great Britain and come down on the continent of Africa around. And, and that was in cargo ships. Ships, slave ships that they would, that the missionaries would travel in, and, and then they would get down and out in, 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 in the coastlines of the continent of Africa, and some of them would move even further into India and then into China. Uh, that was the, the, the first movement of missions, uh, the interior of the continents. Uh, the founder was Hudson Taylor. Why does it say there Hudson Taylor? Oh, because, that's, because I'm reading the second slide. <laughs> that's why we train young missionaries. <laughs> they don't get ahead in the game. <laughs> the first wave. <laughs> Expect great things for God. Yeah, Car William Carey. He went to India. It, 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 this missionary, I mean, you have to read his book sometime. He was the, considered the father of modern mission. He, he left Great Britain, went to India, and never returned. Never returned back home, uh, back to his sending church to his country, William Carey. And he said, expect great things for God. That was 200 years ago. Expect great things for God. How many of you today in the 21st century are believing and expecting great things from God? God is going to do amazing things in the nations, but here in the Northwest as well. He's going to do amazing things in your family. If you just call on his name and believe that the name of Jesus will do what he says he would do. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. William Carey. That was the first wave in the 19th century. Then in the middle of the 19th century, there was the second wave uh, of modern mission. And that was into the interior Now that they had gone on the coastline of Africa and of Asia, now they started to go into the interior. But soon they discovered that, whoa, it's not just China. It's not just one nation, India. It, there's thousands of nations within the nation, uh, people groups, languages, tribes that lived in these nations. So the second wave of missions went into the interior of the continents. One of them was, uh, well, the founder uh, of the movement was Hudson Taylor. He went to China. He founded the uh, China Inland Mission, took hundreds of missionaries into the inland of China. Also, a part of the second wave uh, movement was uh, David Livingstone. And, and David Livingstone, uh, you, we can move the slide over. David Livingstone, he went into uh, Africa. Um, uh, he was part of the interior of the continents, going into the continent. And he said, can the love of Christ... I don't know if what inspired him to write this was probably on one of those cargo ships... He discovered that down below, it's loaded with slaves. And he's going along the coastlines of Africa. And he writes down, can the love of Christ not carry me, a missionary where the slave trade carries the traitor? And he realizes that the gospel had gone to the coastlines, but it never had gone in the interior where the slave traders were bringing out hundreds and thousands of slaves to be sold around the world. And he said, I shall open a path to the interior of Africa or perish, but I will go where these people are coming out without hope, without knowing Christ. That was the second wave into the interior And him going into the interior. Other missionaries going into the interior. They discover that geographical nations is one thing. And people groups is something totally different. David Livingstone encounters so many tribes. So, different, so many different languages. And the third wave of missions started in the 20th century. A hundred years ago. And this was missions to every people group. There are but 200 geographical nations. We were in Mexico. 
Mexico is a, na a geographical nation, but within Mexico, there are 120 different nations that speak their own languages. We work with the Tarasca Purepecha Indians. So the, th the third wave was to the people groups that lived within those geographical nations. And one of them that went was Cameron Townsend. He went to Mexico, then kept walking further south, went to, south Amer to Central America. And, and he had suitcases and uh, cargoes full of Spanish Bibles, Spanish Bibles for everybody. But for most of the population in Latin America, Spanish Bible was Greek. They, he could have given them Greek Bibles. They didn't read the Greek, nor did they read the Spanish. So he goes down to Guatemala. He's working with the Ketchikal Indians. And he's talking to this Indian in the plaza and, and evangelizing the Indians, just looking at him puzzled. And finally, the missionary uh, Cameron Townsend realized he's not understanding a word I'm saying. And sure enough, he started saying anything and the guy didn't understand a thing. So he found a translator and kept talking to the, to the Ketchikal Indian. And finally, the Ketchi, he told him about Jesus and the plan of God and the love of God and how great God is and all in the Ketchikal Indian. After he heard for a while, he said, well, if your God is so big, if your God is so intelligent and so great, how come he doesn't speak my language? Well, that was a, a good question. That was a very good question. Cameron Townsend said, yes. Does my God speak the language of the Ketchikal? Does my God speak the language of the 12,000 people groups around the world? Yes, he does. Through his church. Cameron Townsend started the summer Institute of Linguistics in 1934, later on Wycliffe. And in less than 100 years, in about 70 years so far, the Bible has been translated. I looked up on Google. <laughs> he didn't have Google back then. The Bible has been translated into almost 800 languages. The New Testament has been translated into another 1,700 languages. Portions of the Bible have been translated in another 1,300 languages. In total, over 3,600 languages have a portion or a New Testament or the whole Bible in, the, in, in their language. 3,000, wow. Well, God speaks 3,600 language, languages through his word. Cameron Townsend heard the voice of God through that Indian, the Ketchikal Indian, and said, let's go to work. Actually, last year we graduated a, a, a student from our Bible school seminary, School of Missions in Uruguay, Nico, and he and his wife now are working uh, and translating language number 3,623. In, 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 in the Amazon, in the jungle of, of Brazil, to a tribe that has never had the Bible in their own language. It's happening. And when this gospel of the kingdom is preached and reached to every tribe, to every language, to every people groups in the world, you know what, what will happen then? The end. The trumpet will sound. The king of kings will return. And we're going to be with him for all eternity. And there will be the Ketchikal Indian, the Takaraskan Indians. And from every tribe and from every nation, we will be around the throne forever and forever. That was the third wave. But there was one more wave needed. And I believe that this, the fourth wave, might be the last wave. Why? Because it's called from everywhere to everywhere. That's actually why I'm up here. I don't even speak your language very well. I'm still learning. 50 years ago, I came to this country, <laughs> and I got here, and God called me back to the nation. I'm going, Lord, wait a minute. I just got to the land of the opportunities, and you're telling me I'm going back to the nations? Lord, that's where I just came from. Well, I never had heard about the, the fourth wave from everywhere to everywhere. God said, I'm going to send you right back. Uh, mission fields are becoming a missions force. There, there, there are missionaries coming out of nations where 20 years ago, there were about two, three believers. Missionaries are being sent. Why? Because they have, 
The Ketchikal Indians have the same Bible that you and I have. They have the same commandment that you and I have. The great commission that you and I, They read also, you shall be witness. And the Ketchikal Indian goes, I shall be witness to the ends of the earth. And there goes the Ketchikal Indian. And there's no stopping until he's close to the end of the earth. We sent one of our girls in, in Mexico that got saved among the Purepecha Indians. And she heard the call of God on her life. She got expelled from her, from her town when she got saved. She was threatened that they would finish her if she didn't leave. Uh, she suffered persecution. The family rejected her. We visited her in the Middle East. She is in one of the most difficult. She's married now, a wonderful husband. She's working in one of the most difficult nations in the world where you can take even a Bible. And if, they, if you're found with a Bible under your arm, it can be that you, you will be in prison, but it can cost you also your life. Just for carrying a Bible, it can cost you your life. I asked her when we visited them in the Middle East, I said, aren't you afraid? And then she told me what happened in her town when she got saved when we were in Mexico. She said, so what can they do to me here that they already hadn't threatened to do to me when I was in Mexico? And then she said, well, the only thing that I ask is if I don't return, send a replacement. <laughs> so if anybody's willing to go, you know, just, uh, you can sign up at the, at, the, at the information desk out there. Talking about the information desk, there's our prayer card if you would like to have it. If you don't have it, if you would like to receive our newsletter, you can get our e-news that come out periodically. Uh, then there's a chart here. I just want to show you what's happened in the last 200 years. In early 1800, uh, as you can see in this chart coming up, uh, look, look at that first... Uh, And, and if, you know, you already sang in Spanish, you, know, you can, percent, porcentaje de cristianos evangélicos. Uh, in Northern Europe, that's where Christianity, the evangelical church, the Christian church started or was empowered, had a revival, had a, an awakening uh, for missions. And, and so in 1800, 99% of Christians lived in North America or in Northern Europe, 99%. And 1% of Christians That was but a handful of Christians, you know, three in Mexico, 15 in Central America, 25 in, in, in South America, and 100,000 here in the United States. That was the percentage 200 years ago. Now go over to the last uh, uh, column there, to the year 2000, 30% of Christians live in, 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 in North America and in North Africa, and 70%. I mean, those nations that had but a handful of, of believers uh, 200 years, in that case, uh, yeah, 200 years ago, now have millions and millions of churches. Churches the size of Westgate in places where they used to persecute us and, and, and threaten to kill us 20, 30 years ago. Mega churches taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now in the year 2000, look, 70% of Christian population are in the southern hemisphere, if you would. Uh, but not that the numbers have diminished in the, in the upper northern part. No, it has just increased so much more in the southern uh, parts of the, con uh, of, the, of the globe, of the world. The fourth wave from everywhere to everywhere. We just got here and a couple of weeks ago, a friend called us, a friend I didn't know uh, or I didn't remember. Uh, he, on the phone, the Mexican have a way, they call you and they say, guess who it is? <laughs> I've seen 50,000 Mexico, guess who it is? <laughs> Great, you know, and it's been 30 years since we left Mexico. So I said, no, no, I can't. What's your name? He said, Mardonio. Remember me now? Mardonio. No, I couldn't remember. My wife's name is Maria. Okay, nice talking to you, Mardonio and Maria. Where are you? Are you in Mexico? No, 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 no. God sent us to Eastern Washington. Eastern Washington? What are you doing in Eastern Washington? Where did I meet you? He said, in Bible school. When you were church planning in central Mexico, we went to your Bible school, and, and I was from the town of Lombardia. My wife was from La Ruana. We met at Bible school. I don't know if you remember. You thought we were paying attention to your classes. Yeah, I met my wife there. I mean, I, there, a lot of notes were going back and forth between us. But we got good things out of the class, too. We got married. Uh, God called us. I said, God called you out of Mexico. Where are you now? Well, we're in Eastern Washington. They're in a small town. It's 90% Mexican. In Eastern Washington, it's, 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 a, it's a town called, I mean, known for all the drugs and all, all. Oh, there's so much darkness. 
And God called Mardonio and Maria there. They're working there. We went over and met him, and, and he introduced us to the co-pastor. He said, and this is Francisco and his wife, Andrea, and, and this is our co-pastor. And he gave us his testimony. He said, I was a drug dealer here. Not only a drug dealer, I was also a, a good consumer of all the product, of all what I was selling and whatnot. And, and, and it got to the point where I didn't know anymore what was up and what was down. And I was, I was out, out of it, out of it. And I knew that if I didn't turn around, I had tried everything possible. I knew if I didn't turn around, I, my, my, my life was, was at the end. And, and that week he met the Lord. He met Mardonio. He gave his life to the Lord. God totally saved and, and, and transformed. And the same day or the next day, his wife also had an encounter. She was the, 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 the trafficker. She flushed tons of stuff down and gave her heart to the Lord. And now they're serving the Lord from everywhere to everywhere. Wow, this is an Indian village. It's in Mexico serving here in, in Eastern Washington and being faithful to the Lord. I said, where's your church? Well, we don't have a church. Well, where do you meet? Oh, we meet in a bar. You meet in a bar. You can't meet in a bar. That's not in the Bible. <laughs> he said, the sinners come. It's not a bar. It's a disco. The sinners come on Saturday night and the saints come on Sunday morning. And we try to go there on Saturday night and get as many as we can from Saturday night into Sunday morning services. Some of them stay. They don't know if it's night or if it's morning. They, they end up staying in our services on Sunday morning. More power to Mardonio and Maria. From everywhere to everywhere. That's what God is doing. I mean, you send us to Mexico. Now those churches that were planted 20, 30, 40, 40 years ago, now they are sending their workers, their missionaries to other people groups within Mexico, within South America, but also to the Middle East, to Central Asia, to the Northern African difficult M countries. That's where they're going to the most difficult places. And they're going, why? Because it says in the book. In Tarasco, in, in, in Quechical, it says in all languages, go to the ends of the earth. And once you get there, <laughs> the end is near. We went to Uruguay 25 years ago uh, with a promise. I said, no way, I'm not going to Uruguay. The least evangelized nation in, in, in Latin America, out of 30 nations, Uruguay was down at the bottom, was still considered by many an unreached nation because it had less than 2% of evangelical Christians. Got called three times. I said, no, no, no. Have you ever done a, with God? And you go, no, no. And then eventually, I mean, he wins. And, and, and that's good. Uh, we went. And God gave us a promise. He gave us a promise and then we went. He said, there will be revival. There will be a harvest in Uruguay. And, and, and you, will train, you, you guys will train leaders. Leaders will be trained for the harvest that I will give to Uruguay. But also for the harvest of the nations. From everywhere to everywhere. I love it. So Montevideanos are, are going to... Well, I was going to say Jordan. No, they're not from Montevideo. They're from a small town in, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, that, the town where Fabri uh, uh, Ma Fabricio comes from. Uh, yeah, but I, I point over here because Aaron and Anna have visited Fabricio and worked with the missions team of Uruguay that works there. I mean, his town is not even on Google Map. But you know what? It's on God's map. And he sent them from nowhere to... Well, from everywhere to everywhere. It's what God is doing today. Uh, missions. God's heart for the nations. Oh, God has a heart. Is this the basis for missions? No. This is the basis for missions. I mean, the Bible, missions is the basis for the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, God preparing a bride for his son. From Genesis to Revelation. It's all missions. It's all missions. So this morning, we're going to leave this place here in a few minutes, <laughs> saying, Lord, here am I. From everywhere to everywhere. Send me to my harvest fields. I don't know if it's Eastern Washington, or if it's Ballard, or if it's Linwood, or if it's Edmonds, wherever it is. Workers for the kingdom. Uh, with a heart of compassion. And, and, and praying and believing God. That the numbers coming into the kingdom this day will be the greatest harvest the church has ever seen in its history. Yeah. Matthew 9, 35. 
Jesus went through all the towns and villages. He didn't leave any town out. When we went to Mexico and there were so many towns, I said, what about this town and what about that? We asked the Lord to give us one town every two years. And then when I found out how many towns there were in a radius of 50 miles of Los Reyes where we first lived, I discovered that there were 150 villages in a radius of 50 miles only. And 99% of those villages had no gospel witness whatsoever. I had to live like that guy in the Bible, Methuselah, you know, be, be as old as him to reach every town just 50 miles around. And I said, Lord, there has to be a more effective way to reach every town, every village, every place. And Jesus did it. And he gave us strategies to do it. And, and, and God was gracious enough. But Jesus, he went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Isn't that the command he gave us? Go, go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends. Some will go here, some will go there, but it's here and there and there and there and to the ends of the earth. And you shall be witness to the ends of the earth. And then it goes on to say, well, then he went healing and every disease and sickness and proclaiming the good news. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were har har harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his, disciple, to, to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Play, pray to the Lord, pray to the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. He looked at the multitude and had compassion. That's number one, a heart of compassion. A heart of compassion. When he saw the multitudes, he had deep love for them. Several times it said that moved with compassion, he fed the multitude. Moved with compassion, he healed the sick. Moved with compassion, he made the miracle. A couple of times it said he wept when he saw the lostness of the people all around him. Compassion, a heart of compassion for God so loved the world. How much did it cost him? It cost him everything. He gave his whole life so that the world would be saved through him. In 1983, God called us to central Mexico to, an, to the unreached region and no, no gospel, no, no gospel, no. And finally, we landed in a town called Tacatzcuaro. Tacatzcuaro, it's a Purepecha town. Uh, and, and, and there were two, three believers in the town. Authorities asked us, please leave. Don't come back. And then there were two, three believers, and then there were five, six believers, and then there were 10, 12 believers, and there were 15, 20 believers, and we started building a church. They said, no, don't build a church. We'll dynamite the place for you. Don't come back here, and on and on. Uh, but seeing the need and having two, three believers, I knew God was there. A lady came to church one Sunday morning. We used to start it. Sunday morning, the first service in Takatzcuaro, the second service in the next town in La Magdalena, the third one in Tinguindin, and then come back to the city we lived in in Los Reyes, the first town, Takatzcuaro. A lady, after worship, had been in church for the second time. She raises her hand and is weeping and said, I have something to say. And I thought, she doesn't know what she needs to say or what she can say. This is church now. <laughs> But she's weeping and she... I have something to say and start saying it, started saying it. And she said, I had a goat. Oh, she had a goat. <laughs> I thought, this is great. Great church service today, you know. I had a goat, my only goat. I lost it on Wednesday. And she's weeping and I lost my only goat. It's my company. It gives me milk. It, 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 it lives with, in, in the house with me and on and on. And my goat, my goat Thursday all day. I looked in the town. The whole town of Tokumu was looking for my goat and couldn't find it Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, by, by Saturday afternoon, I knew somebody had made taquitos out of my <laughs> beloved goat. And she's weeping and weeping and weeping. And then it said, this morning I was getting ready to come to church. And there at the door outside, I heard, man. Man. And I opened the door, there was my goat, and she is just weeping. And, and I thought, so much drama for a lost goat. <laughs> and as I said it to myself, he asked me, have you ever 
shed one tear for one of my little sheep, for one of my lost sheep. Ouch! There in the mountains of Michoacán, central Mexico, a humble new believer taught me a lesson that's been with me ever since. I had never heard a lesson like that in any seminary, in any Bible school, in any, I don't know, training place. But it's there. God. I saw Takatskwara in a new light. Compassion. Compassion for that whole region. I guess there's different levels of compassion. Pastor Alec was sharing last Tuesday, he was riding his motorcycle through Eastern Washington when all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came on. I didn't know the Holy Spirit came on a motorcycle. <laughs> I know he does. I know he does. He, the Holy Spirit comes together with the angel that comes alongside and said, I better keep an eye on him. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit came on him and he started praying for Eastern Washington. And he's just saying, oh Lord, save Eastern Washington. Bring your salvation on this region of Washington. You know, it, <clears throat> You can have compassion for one of those that belong to your family that's lost today. You can go, Lord, well, bless this food. Oh, and the prodigal. Uh, bring the prodigal back. Amen. Well, okay. That, it has its... But then shedding a tear. Crying, crying out before the Lord and saying, Oh, Lord, be merciful of me. Be merciful of those around me that are lost without you. May we see our neighborhood. How do we see our neighbors? Oh, I got a terrible one over here. Oh, this is, I don't agree. I, we don't talk. Well, why don't we? Let's, let's start to have a heart of compassion for those around us. Compassion for the nations. And Jesus moved with compassion. Uh, today in the, in, in, in the central regions of Mecca, hundreds of churches, thousands of believers, And the list goes on and on. Compassion. Compassion. On our arrival to Uruguay, it was end of January, and then February 2nd came the evening. We heard wailing. We heard screaming coming from the beaches. Uruguay is surrounded by, by beaches and rivers and whatnot and ocean. And so there's piles of beaches uh, all around uh, Montevideo and, and Uruguay. And we heard wailing and screaming. What's going on? Discovered that February the 2nd, it's when Uruguay celebrated the goddess of the sea. Uh, it's a, uh, a goddess of the sea that they brought from Brazil. And then and, and the mice and the pies, the spiritist leaders go out and, 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 and pray for the people and for protection and for deliverance from fears and from all the stuff that they got because of the darkness that they are living in. And then and, and, and they get further into darkness We were deeply grieved next morning. The newspaper said that there were 300,000 Uruguayans at the beach calling out, weeping out, bringing their offerings to the mice and to the pies. We were deeply grieved with compassion for the lostness of the people of Uruguay. That was 10% of the people that would come out. 10% worshiped a, a false god and, and less than 2% worshiped the true god. And I said, Lord, this has to change. This has to, there has to be a, a reverse in all of this. In those years, the church would, when, when February 2nd came, the church just disappeared. There was no church. There were no Christians. Then a prayer movement was started uh, called Intercessores for Uruguay. Tina would lead worship and we would gather all those that wanted to call on, on God for Uruguay. And, and, and we called for February the 2nd. The next year, churches started moving towards the beaches. And the mice and the pies would dress in, their, in white gowns and, 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 and stand there very elegant and, 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 and saying, come on over and, and, and bring your gold and bring your offerings and I'll receive the offerings and I'll give you a blessing, whatever. And it used to be a, a red ribbon and everybody had a red ribbon on their car, on their motorcycle, on their horse, whatever they were riding or driving on their house, on their office. A red ribbon blessed by the mice and the pies. It was dark. Uh, the church thought, why don't we go out? And they started going out. A, a pastor friend, Luis, told us the story later. He said, I went out too. I put a tent out like everybody else and we went into the closet where we have our baptismal gowns and, and, and put the baptismal gowns. He had the whole worship team put baptismal white gowns on. They looked like the originals. 
uh, the legitimate ones. So, so they stood there in a semicircle and said, come and we'll bless you. Come and we'll pray for you. You're sick, we'll pray for the sick. We'll pray for those that need hope. We pray for those that need salvation. And the lines formed. And of course, if you're in a crowd of 300,000 people, somebody's going to stand in your line. And then the tent back there was for those that needed deliverance. Well, they ended up in the tent and being delivered. And, uh, and God, by his power, would deliver mountains of people. They were the last ones to leave. The church were the, and today there are more Christians that go down to the beach on February the 2nd claiming that the beaches belong to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. <laughs> Olympia belongs to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. Just have a heart of compassion for our state, for our nation, for our neighborhoods, and just watch what God will do. And he may instruct you on what needs to be done. Uh, a heart of compassion. As the Father has sent me, he said, I'll send you now with compassion. Number two, a heart of compassion. Workers for the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Plentiful. Man, there's a harvest out there. We've never seen so many come to Jesus any time in, 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 Christian, in, in Christian history. Nations are coming to Christ. There, there's a couple nations, uh, Mon uh, Mongolia and, and Nepal, that 40 years ago had but three, four believers known. And today they're sending out missionaries. We have some of our students studying in the, one of those nations and, and, and studying with us via internet. Uh, God. Workers for the nations. The harvest is plentiful in terms of population, in terms of resources available. God has blessed us financially. Let's use it for the kingdom. Plentiful in terms of opportunities. I remember when we went to the mission field in 1983. There was a prophecy here in Washington. Ralph Mahoney said, the iron curtain will come down. Prepare and go in. Eastern Europe and Russia will be open to take the gospel in. It will be a window of opportunity. It would open and it will close again. And we, the church, said, wow, that's far-fetched. That's far out there. The Iron Curtain is going to fall. Do you know how many people tried to bring that wall down and it hasn't come down? Well, he prophesied. And then he prophesied that the bamboo curtain in China would open up and missionaries would move into China. But windows of opportunities. Move in, this is the day of salvation for China. Move in, this is the day of salvation for Eastern uh, Europe, for Russia. And the opportunities came. Today, it's all history. The church is strong. The church has multiplied. Those churches now are sending missionaries from everywhere to everywhere. Hallelujah. Windows of opportunities. The workers are few. God called us to Uruguay and said, there will be harvest, but prepare. Train leaders for the harvest in Uruguay. Uh, it was interesting. I, I was just going through some, one of those things that you write down 50 years ago and you look out through them. And I was looking through them and something we wrote 40 years. No, when we, went, when we went to Uruguay 25 years ago, I was looking through. I said, oh, and we prayed for 500 students because there are 700 pastors in Uruguay. We said, let's train 500 more students. It's a, good, it's a good prayer. It's almost 100% increase in, in pastoral strength and in past training pastors and whatnot. The Lord to this day has given us plus 5,000 Uruguayans in Uruguay that are workers for the kingdom. They're workers in the youth ministry. They're workers in, in missions department. They're workers in, in, in the worship department. They're church planners. They're pastors. 5,000. There's over 3,000 churches right now and, and, and growing and going. Uh, workers for the harvest from everywhere to everywhere. We see 60 flags here in the, in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary. Uh, people representing, the, 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 and one of those flag is, flags is my nation too, uh, where I was born. But 60 flags that make Westgate Chapel their home church, but I was born overseas and so there's my flag. Uh, but there's a, another 60 flags that you could put up, that we could put up, of nations that have been blessed through the missions department at Westgate Chapel. 
of, 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 of your blessing of sending out missionaries throughout the world. And those are sending and those keep sending other missionaries further on. The workers are few. And then lastly, to close, it says, a heart for the harvest, workers, willing workers, workers needed. Have you seen the sign out there? You go on the freeway, all, all semi-trucks have workers needed, drivers needed, workers needed. I said, what's wrong with the trucking industry? Everybody needs a driver. Who's driving this one? But anyway, every, every truck out there on the freeway needs a driver. Workers needed. Well, you know what? The mission field needs workers too. I don't know where we should put the signs up, if on the truck or on the church or, or out on the, on, the, on, the, on the... But workers are needed for the harvest. So the Lord said, pray for the nation. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into the nation. Pray, pray, pray believing. Lord, and for some of you, it might be your children that you're praying in without knowing it. How about your grandchildren? You might be praying for some of your grandchildren to go into the fields of the world. Why not? Our young people going into the nations. Why not? There's a young couple going out to the Philippines. Why not? Send them out. Uh, pray specifically. Ask of me and I will give you nations. Uh, pray for workers. Uh, when, you see, when you see in the news, Morocco just had a huge earthquake. Oh, let's flip the channel. The next news will be Libya had floodings and tens of thousands of people disappeared and un unaccounted for. Let's just flip. Let's just watch baseball. Pray. Pray for Morocco. This is God's time of visitation. Pray for Libya, that, that these nations will have a huge turnaround and will come to Christ. You can pray. It says in the Bible, ask of me and I will give you nations. And I'm starting to believe it, that nations belong to the King of Kings, to the church. They belong. They belong to our Lord. They don't belong to the Imanja. They don't belong to, to the gods of this world. They belong to, to Jesus. Uh, pray. Pray specifically. Pray expectantly. expectantly. King David said, I'm, pray, I'm praying to you, God. Why am I praying to you, God, David said? Because I know that you will hear and you will answer. When, we, when, when we're worshiping here, I worship you because I know you see me worshiping you. And when I worship you, you inhabit right here. You come and you hear my petition and you will answer. Pray for a heart of compassion. Pray for workers. Pray for the nations of the world. Let's stand. And as you're standing, why don't you say, Lord... This is an offering to you, my life, my heart. Give me a heart of compassion for the lost around my neighborhood, around in my family, for the nations that still need to be reached for you, people groups that have not been reached yet. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. God the Father asked, Who sh whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah responded and said, Here am I, send me. Father, we come before you this morning and we say, give us eyes to see the harvest fields that are ripe all around us. That is family members, that, that is loved ones that need you today, Lord. Give us a heart like you, ha you had a heart of compassion. And make us willing workers, Lord. Make us willing workers, Lord, to go. Some will go to the nations and some of us and all of us will go to our families, to our neighborhoods, to our county, to our state, to the world in which you have called us to operate in. Here am I, willing worker. And we will all pray for the nations, for the people groups that have not been reached yet to be saved in this hour, in this day, and in this generation. For we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen, amen and amen. Lord bless you.